How many of you have ever done the DNA testing like 23 and me or any of the other ones out there? How many of you have done that? Okay, just a handful of you. How many of you discovered something interesting about your family history in the process? Maybe no one's willing to confess that or <laughs> state that publicly. So for many years, my, my mom's brother, my uncle, had this concept, I think from family pictures, that there was Native American blood in my family. And he figured that my mom was probably 1 16th and we were probably 1 32nd. And he was trying to calculate, do we have enough to qualify for federal funding for college? Eventually, <laughs> eventually gave that up. And then the other uncle, my mom's other brother, took the DNA test. Do you know how much Native American blood we have in us? Yeah, zero. There, there was nothing. So I'm not sure where that story came from, but he thought, at least one brother thought, we had some in us. Now, family histories and family stories are very interesting. They help us orient ourselves to the world. On the other side, my dad's side, someone's gone and done that work for us. If you go to a Mennonite or Amish store in South Central Pennsylvania, these volumes could be yours for a fair price. <laughs> but they tell the story of the Burkholder family, and it's a really interesting story. A story that begins back in Switzerland, of a single mother with her kids making the voyage across the ocean to find a new life here and begin again. It's inspiring. And for me as a kid growing up, hearing the Burkholder story of who we were was like, yeah, I want, I want to live into that story. I want to be a part of this family. And there's a lot of men in that story that were, in fact, pastors. And so it's kind of interesting to think about my own life of being a pastor in that family. Well, stories, especially family stories, help us orient ourselves to the world. When we open up the Gospel of Matthew, he doesn't jump right into the Christmas story like we might want him to. In fact, a lot of us, when we tell the Christmas story, we, we kind of jump from the beginning of the, of the Bible, Genesis 1 to 3, that like God makes the world, it's sin, there's sin, and then like, oh, Jesus, boom. There's a lot in between. And I think because we miss that story so often, we miss the fuller picture of who Jesus is. And so when Matthew wants to tell you, who is this baby in the manger? Or who is this person born to Mary and Joseph? He starts, get this, with a genealogy. Now, I know of nothing that puts audiences to sleep faster than a genealogy. Most people, when they get to that in the Bible, are like, ah, oh, skip. They'll go to the next part, get to the exciting stuff. But Matthew thinks it's really important that you know who his family is, because then you know who he is and what he was meant to do. What we're going to see today, we're going to look at Jesus' genealogy, and we're going to see a couple things. First of all, we're going to see that Jesus entered into a family story filled with examples of promise and failure. His family was called to bless the world, but had failed to be the kingdom of priests it was called to be. And then we're going to see that God's judgment sent the people away from the land of promise into exile from which they awaited the day when God would fulfill his promises to restore them and raise up a new king from the line of David. But it's in Jesus, the one born of Mary and Joseph, that the promises for Abraham's family and for the world are fulfilled. So let's dig into this family history and see what gems are there for us to partake of. I'll just note a couple of things as we start out. There's three different sets of 14 We'll come back to that because that's significant for our author. So we start off here with a heading, and here's what he says. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So he starts off here, and he starts off not at the very beginning, but at Abraham, primarily because he's most likely writing to a Jewish audience, but also because of something significant. Abraham, as we'll see, has a promise that his family was supposed to do something important for the world. So he starts off, verse 2, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob. Why does he want to emphasize Abraham? If you go back to Genesis chapter 12, Abraham had been given a family promise. And here's the promise that God gave to that person. God gave this promise. He says, now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. 
But note this, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so we start off with this family with promise that this is the family through whom God was going to bless all the families of the world. That's a pretty powerful promise. And it doesn't take long before we begin to wonder, is this really a true promise? Take a look. As we continue this story of this family, we bump into those stories that when you get to Christmas time, people like to sweep under the rug. The story people would rather not talk about. So don't get very far here. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah, and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now, if you know Genesis, this is not exactly a great story. Judah had deprived his daughter-in-law of one of the recourses that she had to keep her from falling into poverty. And as anyone who probably trying to figure out what can I do to make my situation better, she does something that was not pretty for her or pretty for Judah. And our author could have easily skipped over this. He could have easily, because he, he follows mostly the men here. He could have just said Judah, Perez, he could have just kept going. But he mentions Tamar because he knows that story's there. Yes, this is a story that's scandalous. And he's not trying to skate over it, not trying to ignore it. He's trying to say, this is a part of this family that God had said was going to bless the world. You might be wondering, with that kind of stuff going on in the family? Yeah, that's the family that God's still going to use to bless the world. Even the ones that have messy stories as a part of them. It continues. So Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Aminadab, Aminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Interesting, again, to mention the mother and Rahab. The first time we meet her, it's in the book of Joshua. And she's a prostitute. Not exactly the kind of woman that you would expect your son to come home with. And yet we're going to see that this woman has taken up because she experiences these two spies, she hides them, and then decides this people really is God's people. She commits her future to that people. She marries into this family. And now she's in the line, as we're going to see, a line of kings. Imagine that transformation, going from being a prostitute to now being a great-great-grandmother of a king. That's pretty special. God can redeem those stories. And I don't know if you're here today and you think, like, man, my story, if you knew who I was, there's no way God can use me. This story is full of all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds that God's able to weave into the story that, through which God is going to redeem his world. And he takes Rahab's story, weaves it back into this beautiful narrative of what God's going to do to redeem his world. It continues, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother, again, was Ruth. So again, you mentioned this other story, and Ruth actually has a whole book in the Old Testament about her. And when you meet her, she's a destitute widow. She's a foreigner brought in with her mother-in-law, and she's there eking out a living. She's picking up grain left over from the people harvesting the fields. And if you had told her, hey, someday you're going to be the great-grandmother of a king, I bet you she would have laughed at you. Her situation was so bleak, she was just trying to survive. And yet, here's this foreign woman that God's going to say, I'm going to take you and I'm going to put you into my family, and it's going to be the family through which I'm going to bless the world. Because watch what happens. Obed is the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. Wow. All these people taken up into a family line that now has a king. And this is the first set of 14 generations that Matthew covers. And it seems like it's going in a certain place, like it's going in a good direction. We've, we started off with a nomad, Abraham. Now we're to like centralized power with King David. We've got a government, we've got a king. It's like, whoa, we're going places. That's the first set of 14. As we're going to see, the next set of 14 is actually the undoing of that. It's the collapse of the kingdom. The story's not just up, it's also a story of going down. And so the next part goes from King David to the exile. 
Let's take a look at the next couple of verses here. Oops, I'm sorry. Let me explain why David's important too. So we've seen Abraham. Abraham had a promise that his family would bless the world. David also has a promise. And his promise is this, that there would always be a king from his line on the throne. So here's 2 Samuel chapter 7. It says this, When your days are over, and this is God speaking through a prophet to the king, King David. It says, When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. And how long? Forever. There's supposed to be a king from David's line on the throne forever. So now we've got two promises in this family. One, to bless all the families of the world, and now you're going to always have a king from this family on the throne. But... As we'll see, this story continues towards its nadir, its collapse in the exile. And in fact, David's a rather interesting figure too. While he is the king, and he's the king that has a promise, there's also a scandalous story about him. And our storyline here does not skip over his problems either. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now this really wants to get all the juicy stuff out there. If you go back and read the Old Testament, David had an affair with a woman that was not his wife. And in fact, it was a wife of his friend. Uriah was one of his close and most trusted soldiers. Not only did he have that affair, he then lined up the military orders to, to be such that Uriah would die in battle, looking like it was just warfare. Really, it's murder. And our story wants to point out that, yeah, King David had this Really cool promise, but guess what? He messed up big time. And in fact, the son from this, this marriage, that David pretty much stole this wife from another person. That God's going to use that son to be the line through which God would redeem the world. So again, this messy, messy story of a family, it's there, and God's going to use it for his glory. Now, as we go through this next set of names, this is going to take us from Solomon down to the exile. Here's what I want you to do. As you recognize a name, just raise your hand, all right? So I realize some of these names might seem foreign to us. So if you recognize a name, I want you to raise your hand. So Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. A little less known, I see that. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Yeah, more, more common, yep. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Not as well known. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Yeah, good. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. All right, there you go. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. My nephew's name, Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. It's hard to overestimate the influence of the exile in the Old Testament. In many ways, it preps you for it from the very beginning. Exodus to Deuteronomy lays out God's covenant with his people and says, if you follow it, you'll stay in the land of blessing, you'll be blessed. But if you don't follow it, you'll be cursed, and I will remove you from the land of blessing. And so you're warned from the very beginning. This is a possibility that if God's people do not follow him, he will remove them from the land. And that is, in fact, what happens. Between 605 B.C. and 586, the Babylonian Empire, which is the major superpower up to the northeast, comes in and through a series of invasions takes away some of the best and brightest young minds and hauls them off into Babylon to serve the foreign empire. Here's a map. Oops, sorry. Here's a map exploring where they went. So Babylon is over in here, the home for Judah, and uh, the exile started here, and they were taken over into Babylon for that duration. They were made to serve their enemies. You can imagine what that was like, but it was also explained in the Old Testament as God's punishment for the people rejecting him. They did not want to follow him. In fact, it says many times that they followed other gods. And so here's how Second Chronicles explains the exile. Why did God allow this foreign country to come in 
and extract his people from the land. Well, here's what it says. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary and did not spare the young men or the young women, the elderly or the infirm. God gave them all into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of the Babylonians. And so the explanation from the biblical tradition is that God, as a means of punishment, said, if you don't want to walk with me and be my people, I will give you into the hands of these other people and their gods. And so God gives them up. And so they endure this time where they are over in, in the exile. Now, if you know your biblical history well enough, you know by 539 BC, another empire arises, Persia. And they actually have a decree that says, hey, you guys have to go back home. And one way of reading it, you could say, well, that, that ends the exile. The exile is over. But there's also a sense in which the exile doesn't end. You see, not all the exiles go back home. And when they do go back home, they find themselves in a place that still feels like they're still in exile. And here's a verse from Nehemiah. Nehemiah is written after the exile. They've gone back into the land. They've rebuilt the walls around Jerusalem. And yet here's the prayer. I want you to just hear how he understands himself back in the land, but Persia is still in control. Notice what he says. He says, but see, we are slaves today. Slaves in the land you gave our ancestors so they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. Note this. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. From Nehemiah's perspective there, the conditions of their sin and their judgment still continue on even in that day. Even though they're back in the land or allowed to be there, they still have this condition of slavery, and they still have this condition of sins hanging over them. And so I would suggest that this idea, and there's a lot of other texts from the Second Temple period, that would reinforce this idea that they continue to see themselves as not fully returned. Yes, some of them have come back, and yes, there's a, 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 an element of freedom here, but they're still paying taxes to a foreign government that they don't want to serve. They're still waiting for, as we'll see, a king to arise. And so this could have been the end of the story. This could have been the end of God's dealing with his people, and yet it's not. Throughout the Old Testament, there is the, the threat of judgment, of the exile. There's also on its heels always the, the, the element of hope. We read one of those passages today. Kevin read Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people. They've paid double for their sins. And so God, in the midst of delivering the harsh word of judgment, also says, but I'm not done. You, you've messed things up, yes, but guess what? I'm still doing stuff, and I still want to do stuff through you, regardless of how much the family has made mistakes, and regardless of how the nation has turned its back on the Lord, he's still willing to work with his people. And so in the midst of that, God gives promises that I'm not done with you. I've got more in store. And so one of those hopes is that God would actually regather his people back to himself. Here is the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23 says this, So then the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt. So that was the past. And God's saying, you're not just going to look into the past, you're going to look into what I'm about to do, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north, that's Babylon, and out of all the countries where he had banished them, then they will live in their own land. There was a hope that one day God would regather his people back to himself. Now again, you might be saying, well, didn't Persia send them back? I'm going to quote a text. Now I know this is going to alarm some of you. I'm going to quote a text that's not in the Bible. I just want to be very clear about that. This is written by a Jewish person between 200 and 150 B.C., and I'm, I'm quoting it simply so you see, there's people still, though they have an element of freedom, even though they're back in the land, they're still expecting this regathering of God's people back to himself. So that's the preface. Here's 2 Maccabees. All right, it says this, and this is a prayer from the main 
person in 2 Maccabees is saying this, we have hope in God that he will soon have mercy on us and will gather us from everywhere under heaven into his holy place. This hope that was originally expressed by Jeremiah, you still see it, 150 BC, still being reiterated by the Jewish people that there's still this expectation God's going to bring his people back to himself. So that's one of the hopes that they had. The second one goes back to that promise we saw to David, that God was going to raise up a king to serve on David's throne. Here's Jeremiah again. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. There was this hope that God's promise to David hadn't just ended at the exile. That if God was going to do a new thing, he was going to remember that old promise and bring a a king to sit on David's throne. And I think that's why when Matthew opens up the book of Matthew with a genealogy and traces it right through David, he really wants you to remember this promise. That there's supposed to be a guy coming from David's line to reign on that throne. So let's continue. This is now our third set. So we've done the first set, which was Abraham to David. That was kind of a story that was going up. Then we went from David to the exile, collapse of all of that. And now we go from the exile to this place of waiting for the one, the Messiah, the one who's anointed to carry out that very task. So here we go. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. So we end on this. We've we've traced the last part. And let me say this. The the exile, if you follow my line of reading it, that was this ongoing experience of we're waiting for God to restore us back. Well, in this third set, I think part of what Matthew wants you to get is that this is the last thing that God's going to do to bring his people back. And and who is he going to do it through? He's going to do it through Jesus, the one who is called Hamashiach. You might know the transliteration of that word into Greek, Christos or Christ. That's not his, Jesus' last name, by the way. It's an affirmation of who and what he is. He is the one who's anointed. And the Mashiach is the idea of anointing. And in the Old Testament, the people who were anointed were prophets, priests, and kings. And so here, calling him the Messiah is saying, this is the one anointed to take on the family mantle that had been laid aside, that had been laid aside in, in, in their disruption and their, their failure to follow God. This is the one through whom God was going to bless the world. This was the one who was designated to be the king through whom God was going to reign and set things to right. And so in case we haven't quite seen the pattern that Matthew wants us to see, He summarizes it in the very next verse. He says, Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David. So that's the first set. 14 from David to the exile to Babylon. And 14 from the exile to the Messiah. And so I think these three stages are very important in Matthew's mind. Because I think what he's saying to the reader, Hey, we had this promise, a series of promises that God gave to us. God gave us a kingdom. We lost that. And we've been waiting for the day when God would restore it. We sing this ancient carol, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Many of you just played it up in the coffee house so beautifully. And what's the next line there? Come and ransom captive Israel that does what? Mourns in lonely exile here. I think I, I think. I, Carol captures something important about Israel's experience of waiting, that that experience of exile, of being distant, like God had not renewed his covenant yet was hanging over them. They were waiting for that moment when God would do something new. And Matthew, I think, is saying the new era has now begun. God has shown up. Messiah is here. This is part of God restoring the world. 
to, what, to the way it was always meant to be. Now, how does he do this? Well, a few verses later, Matthew does start what we traditionally think of as the Christmas story. And the angel tells Joseph, Mary will name this baby Jesus. And here's why. Because the name Jesus means something special. It says, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means Yahweh saves. That God has not stayed back and said, oh man, look at that. That family just messed it up. I'm out of here. No, it's Yahweh saves because God's going to rescue even this family that can't get their act together. God's going to step into that situation and into that world and set it to rights. And so what's he going to save them from, though? He will save them from their sins. If you remember back to that prayer from Nehemiah. Nehemiah says, hey, we're still slaves today. And what was the issue that hung over them? It would say, we are still in our sins. You see, Jesus isn't just the king. He's also the one who's going to fix the cause of exile, sin itself. He was there to deliver his people from their sins. So whatever judgment hung over them, Jesus is going to take that upon himself at the cross and restore his people back to being one with God. That is the release from exile that Jesus would bring. And as we sit and look at this story, we can go a couple different directions. One is this. I imagine you're going to have a bunch of Christmas get-togethers in the next, next few days. And you might be even walking this morning thinking, you know what, my family doesn't have it together. And look at that family over there. They're, they all have matching green or red. Oh, they had time to curl their daughter's hair this morning. I, I just... I'm just glad I got here. I don't know what kind of comments you're, you're bracing for this Christmas season. I don't know if you have hopes for a prodigal to show up. I don't know what kind of brokenness you're stepping into. But when I look at Jesus' story, the, the, the story that he stepped into, this family that was very broken, that had adultery, that had murder, that had rejection of God. All of that was there. And God still said, I'm going to step into that mess. I can still use that. I know some of you today probably doubt God can use you. Yes, he can. If you can use a story like that, he can step into your life and make it new. And so as we look at this story, I wonder how it might impact you this Christmas season as you go into the various contexts that you're going to be getting together. Can you enter it with hope that God can do something that you can't see him doing right now? And then also not hold him, not hold it against him should he not do that? I was just talking to a family up in the blue room before this, and they gave me permission to, to, to share this story. But they had a son who, for many years, had not engaged the faith whatsoever. And after a while, it just got so painful to ask, they just stopped asking. That, that can happen. And then all of a sudden, this past year, the, the, the person announced, hey, I'm going on a mission trip," and floored everybody. And so the parents went back, like, well, why? What's happened? They're like, well, you never asked me about it. Well, I stopped asking. <laughs> Right? You get to the point where you just feel so hopeless, you stop asking because you don't want to remember the pain because you have a higher hope for that person. God can do anything beyond what we might ask or think. So the uncle in the story that took the DNA test, we've been praying for him most of, of my life that I can remember. Shortly after he graduated, he ran off to the Navy, pretty much disconnected from faith, from family, all of that. And I remember my mom just saying, just, just pray for this uncle. And so for all of my life, I've, I've prayed for that uncle, and I don't think he's come back to the faith with, at all. However, um, I, I remember just a couple, number of years ago seeing a different kind of storyline coming out of Facebook as I followed my cousins, his kids. My, the, 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 the girl cousin, um, she got married shortly after high school. That marriage blew apart very quickly, leaving her with, as a single mom. And it just seemed like she was following in, the, in this just a bad series of events, and then all of a sudden, 
about five years down the road, I, I get this message, hey, your cousin got married to a pastor. And I was like, well, yeah, how'd this happen? And then over the past few years, I've, I've watched on Facebook to see that my, my uncle's grandkids, almost all of them have been baptized into the church. And that was just something I never expected as a child, praying for this family, that, that God would redeem my uncle's grandkids. We're still praying for him. But God has found his way into that story in a way I never expected. And so there are situations I know you're still hoping and praying for. Can you let God have them? And invite him into those spaces this holiday season. Now, some of you might be resonating a bit more with the experience of exile. You might be sitting around thinking, well, wait a minute. If this, is, if this is blessing, if this is all it is, why is there still so much suffering? Why is my family hurting? Why is Brooke still in the hospital? We might feel that we're still in exile. We're still waiting for the fullness of God's blessing to fall upon us. And in many ways, the whole arc of the Bible it's a story of exile and return, just like Israel's story. Think about this, even the Garden of Eden. In the beginning, humans flourished in every conceivable way. Their relationship with God was authentic, and they felt no need to hide. Their relationship within their marriage was open, honest, and without shame. And their relationship with nature was symbiotic. And when sin enters, all that was turned upside down. But the end of the biblical story is of God and people coming together again to flourish in all those capacities of, of human to human, of human to God, and human to nature. The end of Revelation is that picture of all of those flourishing on all capacities. The midpoint of the biblical story, though, is this person, Jesus Christ, born to Mary and Joseph. And it's that person through whom God was going to fix what is broken in our world. He would launch no military campaign against the Romans. He would acquire no political freedom for his, his country. And though innocent, he would suffer the curse of death on behalf of his people. And yet, that is the person that God would vindicate three days later on Easter morning. And so as Christians, we do not proclaim that all is well with the world. There is still brokenness here. We still see the brokenness in our families. We, we feel it in our bodies. It's not gone forever. What we do say is this, that God began the work of renewing and restoring the world in that person of Jesus Christ. And on Easter morning, we saw a picture that God has the power to fix the world and gave us the promise and the hope that one day what's happened to Jesus will happen to those who have faith and trust in him. And so we come. And just like the carol of old, we still say, yes, O come, O come, Emmanuel. We want him to come and rescue us. But what we say is we've tasted the goodness of the Lord. We think that there's more to come when he comes again. So we taste it in small ways here. We taste it, for instance, when, we've, when we're forgiven. Some of us have stories that compare the stories in Jesus' family. And God has seen those, and he said, I forgive you. I release you from that. That kind of forgiveness makes us want the world to come even more. We've also experienced love, unconditional love. This isn't the love that just says, well, you can do whatever you want. I'll let me do whatever I want. It's the love that says, I know what you've done. And guess what? I want to rescue you. I want to be here with you. I want to be in the mess with you. So as we taste and see the goodness of the Lord, we wait and hope for the fullness that will come. God has come once. We wait for him to come again. And part of what Advent is all about is reminding ourselves that we wait for the fuller restoration, that God has begun it in Christ. We wait for its fullness in the world to come. Will you wait with me patiently, brothers and sisters? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we long, we long for the fullness of your restoration. Lord, we long to see our families whole. We long to see the prodigals return. We long to see our bodies restored. And so, Lord, as we wait, we invite you to come. 
Help us taste and know that you are good, that you have good things in store. In Jesus' name, amen.